All this right, we'll get this. Okay. But <laughs> uh, no, go oh, I just wanted to make sure we get our stragglers to come on. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. My name is Susan Lautenbach and I'm with SK Life Science and I'm also a volunteer today with Epilepsy Awareness Day. We thank you so much for spending yesterday and today with us and um, hopefully you find these talks uh, amazing and um, get a lot of information out of them. It is uh, my greatest pleasure to introduce Dr. Wexler. Dr. Wexler is an epileptologist who specializes in research of novel treatments for epilepsy. He is in private practice in Boise, Idaho, and is the medical director of the Idaho Comprehensive Epilepsy Center, and is very active in several national epilepsy organizations. While cannabis is not legal in Idaho, he was an, an investigator in one of the pivotal trials for Epidiolex and organized the Idaho EAP for that product. So without further ado, Dr. Wexler, thank you for, for your time this afternoon and for your presentation and it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Okay, good. So I, I am, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for inviting me. Um, I've heard about this conference for many years, but it's the first time I've had an opportunity to present. Um, and um, the, the only regret comes from my family. They, they, they wish they could combine this with a trip to Disneyland. So yes, <laughs> uh, may, maybe someday. Um, I uh, volunteered to give this talk because it's an area that I've read about a lot. And uh, the slide presentation that I have um, uh, is, was actually designed for a physician group um, and so I kind of went through it and took out some of the more um, hardcore and um, uh, uh, science stuff, but kept some of it in. And what I want to make sure is that everyone at the end of this time um, has a better understanding of CBD and feels like they've got their, their questions answered. Um, this is just a, a map of how I got to where I am. I, I, grew up back east and uh, trained in Chicago and Phoenix and at Stanford where I did my epilepsy fellowship before opening up the Idaho Epilepsy Center in, in um, 2005. Um, I, I'm always in the habit of, of being uh, open about what I'm doing with uh, the pharmaceutical industry. I work with a lot of the companies in clinical trials, in um, education, content development, teaching other doctors how to, how to use the medications appropriately. And so you can see all those disclosures there. Um, and specific to CBD, as Susan said, I, I was an investigator in one of the Lennox Gasto studies for Epidiolex. Um, I'm a member of the Cannabis Education Working Group, which is, um, uh, has independent content, but, it, but the work is funded by by Greenwich, the company that makes up a dialect. Um, and, um, you know, when you do these talks, you're never supposed to use the brand names in talks, at least when you're presenting to physicians. Um, but I do think it's important to distinguish between epidiolects and all other versions of CBD. And so you will be seeing the word epidiolects on my slides quite a bit. Um, patients come in all different forms. And, and uh, this is a direct quote from a patient um, a couple, about a year or two ago when there was particular hype about CBD. And he said, um, science is just drug companies trying to fill you full of pills that rot your brain. What I've seen with CBD online is magic. Don't you believe in magic? Um, and I, so I had to include that quote in, in these presentations. And, 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 I, and I even added a magical transition. And of course, we all get these emails about the benefits of CBD oil, and and I don't, uh, you know, some people say, you know, I've got 99 problems and CBD fixes 86 of them, um, because if you listen to people's uh, anecdotal claims, uh, it seems to work for just about everything. That's probably not realistic, right? Um, what makes it even more complicated is that we toss around a lot of terminology. And uh, it can be difficult for, for 
patients, their families, and, and even their doctors to really keep track of what's what. And we'll go through some of this today. Um, you know, you hop on the internet and it seems like CBD is making everyone feel better uh, for one reason or another. And it's hard for doctors to know what to do when they don't have science to point to, right? So um, think about the way we make decisions when science is a consideration. You know, science doesn't know the answer. That means no one knows the answer. I, I got that from a comedian. Um, I can't remember who the comedian was off the top of my head, but if science doesn't know, that means no one knows. It's not like science doesn't know, but my bud tender has a theory, right? Um, so uh, last year, uh, the Mayo Clinic came up with a clinician's guide to cannabis. And um, it has a lot of good information about how to use these products if you're gonna use them. And so you'll see references to this um, publication throughout my talk. And if anyone in the audience has more of a clinical background and wants to read the, 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 the full guide, uh, there's the reference for it. All right, so what do we know about cannabis and about THC in particular? Recognizing that um, most of the science that's been funded by the federal government has really focused on the dangers of cannabis and THC, but there has been good science done. And we know that cannabis can be associated with addiction, with cognitive deficits, that it can alter mood, can predispose to psychotic disorders, especially if someone is already uh, has some issues in that uh, direction. And we have decent evidence that the effect might be um, more pronounced in women. Um, and we certainly know that the cognitive side effects um, of cannabis and THC can be more pronounced in uh, young people and, and, and can have negative effects on the developing brain. So prior to the early 20s, anyone younger than that, um, uh, there's significant cognitive deficit risk with, with excessive cannabis use. Um, when you look at um, reviews that have been done, looking at all of the literature, you go into the National Library of Medicine website and, and you can see what's been published and you can do all kinds of searches. Um, and, and the Mayo Clinic folks did this. And what they said was, you know, there's some evidence of moderate quality that, that um, cannabinoids might be, um, and cannabinoids are the active chemicals in cannabis, right? There's about a hundred cannabinoids in, in cannabis and um, the two most prevalent are THC and CBD. So we know that can cannabinoids seem to possibly be beneficial with chronic pain and spasticity. There's low quality evidence to support use for nausea and vomiting due to chemotherapy or to enhance weight gain in people with HIV. Um, it's, it, it, certainly can be sedating. And, and so there's this argument that it could be used for sleep disorders. Um, and it may be beneficial in Tourette's, although we don't definitely know that as yet. Most of the randomized controlled, you know, placebo controlled studies that have been done on these topics have focused on THC medicines, right? So uh, medicines that are basically um, synthetic analogs of THC. Um, there were only, um, before Greenwich started doing their work with CBD, there really were only um, four studies that were found in this literature search um, uh, with CBD. So it wasn't studied very much at all until Greenwich got involved with it. So Epidiolex is the FDA approved version of CBD that's made by Greenwich. And it was approved in June of 2018. Um, it's a highly purified CBD oral solution. It's uh, dissolved in sesame oil. 
and um, because that's how it stays in solution the best, so you don't have to shake the bottle when you when you give it to the patient. Um, it significantly reduced seizures more so than placebo um, in Dravet syndrome and in Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So they did one Dravet study, two Lennox-Gastaut studies, and recently it got approved for seizures associated with tuberous sclerosis. One thing I remind people is this is not approved to treat Dravet syndrome or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome or tuberous sclerosis. It's approved to treat the seizures that are seen in those conditions. Um, and, and that's a fine little nuance, but on the doctor's side, it helps when we have to argue with insurance companies um, to, get, to get the drug approved sometimes. This drug development program happens to have been the most comprehensive look at CBD to date. And it's really the best source of information about CB, CBD safety and side effects um, that, that were seen in those studies. A lot of people are curious about CBD for pain. What, as many of you know, in the United States, we have an opioid crisis and there's a tremendous interest in finding alternative pain medicines that don't work through the opioid system. Um, and so there's a lot of hope and a lot of hype about using CBD for pain, but very little science so far to support uh, its use as a pain medicine. Um, and in fact, when you look at even big reviews, um, you know, the Department of Veterans Affairs found some evidence that, that cannabinoids might be beneficial with pain, um, but other uh, similar large analyses have been inconclusive. What about topical? You know, I, I, I test drove, the, the first time I, I gave this talk was actually to my mother-in-law and her friends at the country club. I've been giving lectures for 15 years on all kinds of topics. The first time anyone said, hey, we wanna hear your talk. Can you give it to us at the club? Um, so they were all very interested in the concept of topical CBD products. Bottom line is um, even if you put other agents in the solution that in, enhance um, permeability, um, it's, it's highly unlikely that anything topical is gonna get you a dose in your body adequate to actually do anything other than moisturize your skin. Um, if it helps you have at it, I don't think it's dangerous, but from a science standpoint, there's not much evidence that CBD can be absorbed through the skin to a degree that would actually be beneficial for pain or for seizures or anything else. In fact, I did my own uh, PubMed search specifically looking at what science has been done in the whole history of the um, uh, Library of Medicine in the United States. And there were only 12 papers and really nothing uh, convincing to say that, that CBD gets meaningfully uh, absorbed through the skin. All right, let's shift a little bit to terminology. Cannabis is the plant from which um, these um, chemicals are extracted. The scientific name of cannabis is Cannabis Sativa L. Now, you hear a lot of, well, you know, this one's cannabis and this one's hemp, sorry, hemp, is also cannabis sativa L. Um, and the, the cannabinoids that people are interested in, whether it's THC, CBD, or whatever, um, tends to be concentrated in the leaves and the flowers and has, tends to have very little concentration in the stems and, and stalks, right? Think back to your college days, um, you wanted you wanted bud. You didn't want a lot of um, you didn't want a lot of stems and things in in what you might have been using recreationally. Same same concept applies with hemp. Those plants are still cannabis sativa L. They are uh, bred to make um, a lot of stalk and stem, 
because it's fibrous and those fibers can be used in textiles and things like that. When you see hemp oil with CBD, usually what they're doing is extracting CBD from some other cannabis plant and dissolving it into the hemp oil. But the hemp plant itself has relatively less of the cannabinoids just because of the way that it's bred. Well, I just told you what the difference is. All right, so there's, um, if you go into a dispensary, you'll hear a lot about sativa versus indica. It's all cannabis, sativa L, and whether or not there's really major difference is hard to say. Although, you gotta recognize that it's a plant and plants grow in different ways. And you, know, you can have um, uh, uh, wine grapes are also a plant and you can have Cabernet or you can have Chardonnay and they can be very different, but they're all cannabis and people. I talked about the difference between hemp, hemp oil, hemp seed oil, same concept. The seeds don't have much in the way of cannabinoids either. It's the flowers and the leaves. So when you mix the flowers and the leaves together, that's what most people refer to as marijuana. Although um, I think when we're done with this talk, you're gonna find that you don't want to use the word marijuana anymore. This whole plant concept gets kicked around a lot, but maybe the whole plant extract might be better than just CBD or just THC. There's not a lot of real science to support that. What was reported in some animal models, not in humans, was that THC might be more intoxicating when CBD is around. And the people that are eager to sell CBD have kind of turned that on its head and said, well, if THC gets you more high when there's some CBD around, then the opposite must be true that any medical benefit you might see from CBD might be made better by the other ingredients in the plant. There's absolutely zero science to support that. Recreational marijuana versus medical marijuana. You guys are all over that in California, um, but um, it, it's often the same uh, product being sold in different ways. What's the difference between CBD oil and cannabis oil? CBD oil, regardless of what the oil is in theory, is going to be just CBD in a higher concentration, right? So the, the gold standard would be epidiolex. It's CBD and sesame oil, that's all it is. And it's highly concentrated. When you buy CBD oil from a dispensary, they will tell you that it's X percent CBD or X number of milligrams per CBD per bottle. Um, and, and they might use different oils, but it's the same concept, dissolving CBD in oil that people can take orally. Cannabis oil is an extract that um, is, is really more whole plant, but the main mission of cannabis oil is to concentrate the THC as much as possible, get you high. This is the stuff that they put into the, the um, vape pods that, that you know, people were getting sick with last year. Um, was cannabis oil. And then it had vitamin E in it, and it turned out that was bad. There's all kinds of different cannabinoids. So the, the cannabinoids we talk about from plants are called phytocannabinoids, that's THC, CBD, et cetera. Those cannabinoids imitate natural cannabinoids that we have in our own bodies called endocannabinoids, and they bind to the cannabinoid receptors, and there's different kinds of cannabinoid receptors. And then there's synthetic cannabinoids that people make, right? They're both good, like some of the uh, THC containing medicines that are out there and bad, like uh, things like spice that, that kids get high with sometimes. So what's the historical use of medical cannabis? You know, it was 8,000 years before the common era, it was being used in, in China for um, a variety of things. Um, and it, it's been used medically even um, 2000 years BC um, for hundreds of different medical conditions. I, you know, one of the things I ask people is, does it actually treat the condition if you're doing the whole cannabis plant or does it just make you not care that you have the condition? Um, 
Cannabis was introduced to European medicine in the 1800s. It was used quite a lot by Victorian neurologists for the treatment of epilepsy because there weren't really any other treatments at that time. The bromide salts came out in the late 1800s. Um, but the medical use weaned uh, or, or waned as, as we got into um, the 1900s. So this was the beginning of the era. It was the Industrial Revolution. It was the beginning of era of rigorous scientific investigation of drugs. Uh, people were making more synthetic medications. Um, uh, there was industrialization, commercial, commercialization. You were buying and selling instead of growing stuff. Um, in 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed that basically prohibited interstate commerce of adulterated or mislabeled foods and drugs. And it was that um, law that ultimately led to the formation of the FDA in the 1930s. And during this era is also when uh, marijuana or cannabis became prohibited uh, in the United States. So the word marijuana, 1910, there's a re revolution in Mexico and you all might find similarities between, you know, because what's, what's old is new and what's new is old. Um, there was political upheaval in Mexico that resulted in a large influx of immigrants from Mexico across the southern border into the United States. And this caused a lot of consternation for people. You know, we got to protect our borders. And uh, police officers in Texas uh, claimed that uh, marijuana incited violence and lust for blood and gave its users super, superhuman strength. Uh, rumors were spreading that, that uh, these Mexican immigrants were distributing this loco weed or killer weed to American school children. Use of um, cannabis was uh, associated with African-Americans, with jazz musicians, prostitutes, and, and with people in the uh, underworld. So it was a made up word that came into usage in, in uh, the 20th century. And it was a word that was meant to underscore the Mexicanness of cannabis. And it was meant to create fear and uh, particularly play off anti-immigrant sentiments in the United States at the time. Um, so um, fear of brown people and their nightmare drugs led to public action against the marijuana menace. So when you say the word marijuana, just know that it's, it's um, a pretty racist term with a really dark history that's just kind of come into popular use. So I'm, I try more and more to just shift my conversation towards the word cannabis instead of the word marijuana. As uh, those in California might recall, um, there was a, 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 a interest in cannabis that grew through the 60s and 70s um, socially and scientific interest in cannabis uh, started to build in the 80s and 90s. Um, that's when the endocannabinoid system was discovered, the cannabinoid receptors were discovered. There were anecdotal reports of benefit for various medical things, including seizures among people who are using marijuana. Um, and there was this idea that maybe we could find a way to generate a useful medicine out of this. That's when uh, GW, which is the, sort of the parent company of Greenwich in Europe, first got involved in this research. In the United States, the federal research still focused on the dangers of recreational THC. I'm just going to do a brief shout out to Sativex just because it's on the market in other parts of the world and likely will be on the market in the United States soon. But it's a 50-50 combination of THC and CBD. Um, and it's a, 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 like a mist that you spray into your mouth. Um, and um, has been approved in other countries to treat spasticity and multiple sclerosis um, and is being investigated for other uses. And um, it, it, among those, it's being investigated for approval in the United States. Epidiolex is um, sort of, like I said, the gold standard for, um, for CBD. And hold on a second. I don't wanna show you that, that's really boring. That's more 
more detail than we want to jump into uh, for the purpose of this talk. If anyone wants to dive deeper, feel free to ask me questions or you can uh, reach out to me when I'm done. The, the first question from a practical standpoint with patients and families is, does the drug work? And the answer is that it does. If you look at the Lennox gas stove studies, it was about twice as good as placebo at, uh, at reducing uh, the average number of seizures per month, uh, which you see on the left side of the slide for the main study. And of course, when we do these studies, patients always go into an open label extension where the placebo patients get an opportunity to also try the drug. And, and in open label extension studies, the medication is provided for free to the participants for uh, up until the drug is approved. It gives them continued therapy. So if they did well on it, we don't, we're not pulling it off, pulling them off of it and making their seizures worse. Uh, but it also gives the company long-term information about safety and tolerability. And so what you can see on the right side of the slide is that um, the tolerability or the efficacy was sustained uh, over the open label period. I um, wanted to do to, they always say you can't compare drug studies to each other because they are done at different times. And when they're done at different times, the populations are different. And so it's an apples to oranges whenever you com compare drug studies to each other. But in 2000, um, when was this done? Oh, in 1993, um, uh, they got together and did this and, and it's been revised over the years. Um, this is a comparison of the drugs that were formally studied and approved for uh, lennox gasto syndrome. So um, they're doing what you're not supposed to do. They're comparing the Lamotrigine studies to the topiramate studies and so forth. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to take the, um, the, uh, the Epidiolex data and put it on the same graph and see how it compares? And it works, right? So the darker bars are the drug, the lighter bars are the placebo. Um, does the drug work? Yes, we know that it works. It's FDA approved because it works. Um, how does it compare to the others? You know, it's not a dramatic standout. I, looking at this, um, looking at this graph, you might say, well, you know, clobazam maybe is a little bit more effective in LGS maybe um, than, than CBD and CBD is maybe a little bit more effective than some of the others. But these are all drugs that can legitimately be used in lennox gesto syndrome. And if, if you have a child with lennox gesto you know that um, in that community, there are a few patients who do remarkably well, who've become seizure free with this or that, but most people with Lennox Gasto don't achieve 100% seizure freedom. And so over the, over the lifespan, most Lennox Gasto patients have an opportunity to try most of these drugs, uh, so long as the doctor keeps trying new things and doesn't just park you on one drug for a long, long time. Uh, this is similar uh, data, right? So this is the Dravet study. And um, the success rate for, for seizures uh, suppression or, or reduction was about three times better with CBD than with placebo in the Dravet study. And again, in the open label extension, continued effectiveness over time. Safety is where the story gets a little more interesting. Um, we know that cannabis uh, and cannabinoids and CBD in particular uh, can make you tired. CBD, unlike its cousin, uh, CBD can actually decrease appetite and can be associated with diarrhea. Um, and um, you know, if if um, the, the diarrhea has actually been in for for some of the families I take care of, the diarrhea has been a, a deal breaker. Um, in many patients who participated in these studies, however, the big deal was not the sleepiness or the diarrhea or the decreased appetite, but the fact that CBD at useful doses um, can harm the liver. Um, and it's a big enough issue that the recommendation from the FDA and from Greenwich is 
that um, you should check liver functions before starting Epidiolex to make sure the liver is okay to begin with, and then check liver functions again at one month, three month, and six month uh, time points after starting it to make sure the liver is still okay. And then beyond that six month time point, it's up to the doctor to decide how often um, uh, they're gonna be checking those liver functions. The, the reason this is particularly important, it, there, there are a couple of things that you gotta take out of this. First of all, it was a dose dependent effect, which means that the higher dose was more likely to cause the problem. The lower dose and the lowest test dose was 10 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. Um, still, there were some patients, but nowhere near as many as on the higher dose that had the liver issues. So, you know, imagine that you're a company selling this. You would love to market and sell lower doses because it gives you the opportunity to backpedal away from the liver issues. But lower doses are not being marketed and were not approved because lower doses didn't work. So when you get your bottle of supposedly concentrated CBD oil from the dispensary that may or may not actually have what it says on the label because it's a supplement um, or from the gas station, and it says um, you know 30 milligrams per dose, you know, you're getting about one tenth of the minimum effective dose there. It's not likely to do a whole lot uh, of good, and it's not likely to do a whole lot of harm because the dose is so low. Um, the problem is that the concentration of CBD oils uh, that are being sold online and, and in dispensaries is, is getting higher and higher. And uh, the dispensaries don't know that you should be getting your liver functions checked if you're taking CBD chronically. And so be very mindful of that. If you're getting CBD for yourself or for your child and you're not using the prescription, uh, the, the pharmaceutical grade Epidiolex by prescription, if you're getting it anywhere else, two things you absolutely have to know. The label may or may not be accurate because it's not being regulated by the FDA. And if it really is concentrated, then you should be checking liver functions or your primary care should be checking liver functions to make sure you're not harming your liver um, with those products. So that's the big deal on the adverse reactions. The, hepato, or the hepatocellular injury is the liver injury. And then the sleepiness is the second most um, prevalent thing we need to think about. The other stuff that's on the list, you know, suicidal thinking, that's a whole nother lecture. Um, depression, suicidal thinking are, are more common in epilepsy than in the general population. Um, there was a huge meta-analysis done by the FDA 10 years ago across multiple drugs, multiple studies. There was a weak signal for an increased risk of suicidal thinking with drugs versus placebo, but it was a problematic analysis and, and that signal for suicidal thinking has never shown up as a, a side effect for any individual drug. And believe me, we ask. Um, so it's on the list, but the things to know about uh, Epidiolex is watch out for liver injury and, and you might see some sleepiness. Um, CBD itself is not addicting. They, they actually did uh, studies comparing CBD to um, uh, a benzodiazepine, alprazolam, and comparing it to a synthetic THC compound. And they gave it to known drug users. And um, uh, then they fill out um, this questionnaire and they come up with something called the stoned score. And, um, and Epidiolex didn't really separate from, uh, from placebo there very much. And so, um, that's why it was actually unscheduled recently. So it's no longer a controlled substance. Epidiolex, C CBD at the dispensary is still a controlled, is, is, not a, is still illegal um, uh, and, and is considered schedule one. So it is, a con it is a controlled substance, but it's a controlled illegal substance. Uh, CBD uh, that is in Epidiolex is FDA approved and is not a controlled substance. 
The drug interactions also are super important. It turns out that the most common drugs that were used in the patients who participated in the research studies were Depakote and Onfi, Clobazam. And um, you're much more likely to see the liver issues when you add CBD on top of Depakote. And you're much more likely to see the sleepiness when you add CBD on top of Clobazam or Onfi. And part of the reason for that, by the way, is that CBD has a lot of behind the scenes drug interactions, one of which is really slowing down how uh, clobazam is metabolized in the body. So what I really want you guys to know, to be able to take away from this, is that not all CBD products are created equally. Um, cannabis oil can be dangerous. CBD oil may or may not contain CBD in it, depending on where you're buying it. Uh, so you have to be careful of that. Science helps to keep us safe. Science and medicines is why the life expectancy is no longer 35 years. Um, we, we live a lot longer you know, because of better living through science and chemistry. Um, there are so many myths um, that, that people buy into, but think about it. Um, no pain, no gain. We now know that walking it off is a bad idea if you've injured yourself. Um, getting a base tan prevents sunburns. No, well, getting a base tan also predisposes to skin cancer. Um, carrots are good for your eyes. Eh, not really in quantities you can actually eat. Um, chocolate was a health food for a while. Um, and it turns out, mm, maybe not so much. Um, for a long time, people thought juice was a healthy alternative to soda, but often the juice that we buy has just as much sugar in it as soda pop does. Um, uh, gl Gluten-free will help you lose weight. You know, there are some people who are le legitimately gluten intolerant, but there are far more people who are um, putting themselves on, on gluten-free diets than there are people who need to be on gluten-free diets. Um, eight glasses of water per day, Drink water when you're thirsty, pay attention to your body, recognize when you're thirsty, but counting the number of glasses of water is probably not a great practice. Um, I love this one. I, you know, so I see some of this on my phone and I take screenshots to put into my talks. Sorry, your essential oils are essentially useless. Um, again, most things um, that you can put on your skin are not gonna get adequately absorbed to make a biological difference. Might make moisturize your skin. And of course, um, the, the one that I'm sure you all know, um, the, the old myth that you should put a spoon in someone's mouth uh, so they don't swallow their tongue when they have a seizure. I hope you all know that we should never put anything inside someone's mouth while they're having a seizure. They're not going to swallow their tongue. It's a good way to get your finger chopped off, um, and it's a good way to break their teeth. And, and, and they'll choke on your finger and choke on their own teeth, but they're not gonna choke on their own tongue. Um, people buy into all kinds of hype, right? So recently there was a measles outbreak that was fueled by an anti-vax movement. Um, so that's a real problem. Um, and um, there was another thing that was kind of trending on social media about um, drinking bleach to treat autism. And, and obviously that's, crazy and not appropriate. Okay, this is, this is like a quiz. Um, this, this was in the news. Um, it didn't get as much attention as CBD did, but there's this chemical, there's this, there's this product. It reduces your risk of death from just about any cause. It's linked to lower risk of heart disease, stroke, and even suicide. Um, as I'm, as you, you might be reading this along with me, write down what you think this product is. I won't make you share, but but I want to, unless you're super brave, you can share, but um, uh, I, just out of curiosity, see if you can guess what this is. Um, lower risk of heart attack, stroke, and suicide uh, prompts your body to burn more fat. Um, it seems to slow down the aging process. It improves brain health and age-related cognitive decline. It makes, you, it makes you do math better, makes your conversations better, and makes your workouts better. 
Okay, everybody ready? Coffee. Is it really, is coffee really that good? It sure sounds good, doesn't it? Oh, I'll take it any day of the week. <laughs> And, and and honestly, I do take it every day of the week, multiple times per day, but I don't think it's the coffee that that is necessarily responsible for every good thing that happens in my life. The FDA does a really good job of protecting us. Remember, we've got thousands and thousands of drug and food items that are coming on the U.S. market, and they're regulated by the FDA, but it's impossible for the FDA to evaluate every single product on the market. They don't touch the supplements at all. Um, they never look at them unless they make a medical claim, then they, then they slap them down. Um, what really makes the FDA work well is the threat of an inspection. God help you if you're selling something that comes that, that's regulated by the FDA and they come into your shop um, or into your factory and they discover that you're doing something um, shady, they're gonna be all over you. So it's the threat of inspection combined with, you know, they look at about, you know, one or 2% of the stuff that gets onto the market. Um, but boy, you don't wanna get crosswise. So it's the threat of an inspection that keeps us safe. And over the years, ever since the 1930s, they've done that, right? Uh, we no longer have Dr. Pierce's um, spring tonic uh, and blood purifier on the market. Um, we no longer have um, tapeworm, uh, san sanitized tapeworms for weight loss uh, because of the FDA. These are all images, by the way, from the FDA website. Um, they, uh, they put the kibosh on uh, vitamin donuts. Um, and my personal favorite, Pratt's healing ointment for man or beast. We both use it. The, the man and his horse both take it. So this kind of stuff, th these, are, these are actual products that were on the market that got pulled off by the FDA way back when. But you know, a more modern example, the, there, there was a, a recall of uh, liquid ibuprofen because of safety concerns um, um, about a year ago. So, you know, the FDA is doing its job, um, catching stuff when they can, and the, the fear that they inspire with the threat of inspection helps to keep us all safe. The FDA has sent warnings to CBD companies that's, that make products for online and um, use and for dispensary use. Uh, they send out these warning letters when medical claims appear to be made. Things are misbranded, um, uh, things are um, uh, being touted for medical benefits without, um, without the science to back it up um, or, the, or there are impurities in the product that are not disclosed on the label. Um, this is a little more granular detail on um, some of the products that were, um, that have received warning letters. You'll notice that some of them will say high concentration CBD on the label, and then when when but they made medical claims and so they got analyzed, and and then it turned out that they had zero percent CBD or very you know one or two percent CBD compared to the you know, ninety eight percent CBD that you get with Epidiolex. So if you want to um, do your own homegrown uh, CBD treatment rather than um, than the Epidiolex you've got to know the concentration and you've got to achieve doses that approximate the doses that, that for which Epidiolex was approved. And that's going to be cost prohibitive. You know, if you're going to buy a bottle of um, Charlotte's Web from, from um, Colorado, um, to get an adequate dose, you might be going through a bottle a day or a bottle every two days. Um, and they're charging 200, 250 bucks a bottle that's actually more expensive than going to the pharmacy and paying for uh, um, paying cash for Epidiolex even before insurance gets involved. And of course, insurance will cover 
epidylics in most cases, whereas um, the dispensary stuff is obviously not going to be covered by the insurance. Um, again, a, a, a little bit more detail. Be real careful with anything that's a synthetic cannabinoid. These have led to all kinds of problems and hospitalizations and regulations are changing in states all, all over the country. Um, there, one analysis of um, 84 different online CBD and hemp oil products in 2017, 84 products, only 26 out of the 84 were accurately labeled for how much CBD and how much THC was in the bottle with the two most common errors being overestimating how much CBD and underestimating how much THC was in those oils. And there have been case reports uh, out of uh, some of the early states like Colorado of kids on quote unquote pure CBD oil from a dispensary showing up with THC intoxication um, in the emergency rooms because there's more THC in that oil than, than is disclosed. So supplements are super popular. I mean, who hasn't bought a supplement and thought, well, you know, um, Dr. Oz said that it did this or that, and maybe it does and maybe it doesn't, but what could it hurt? It's only 20 bucks, right? Um, but how many supplements really pan out? Uh, did anyone really lose weight with raspberry ketones uh, or with green tea extract? Um, did probiotics really fix everyone's stomach issues? Um, uh, coenzyme Q10 was um, touted for Parkinson's until a research study was done that was placebo controlled and showed that it made no difference. Um, uh, multivitamins, turns out most of the multivitamins that you buy at the store, you just pee out. Um, it's very difficult to get extra vitamins effectively into the body. Um, apple cider vinegar has been very popular. If you're into drinking vinegar, you know, have at it, but the, the, the true nutritional uh, value is questionable. Um, honey, of course, has been bandied about as, as beneficial in all kinds of ways. Um, but what about, you know, shark cartilage? You, you know, can you go down to Mexico and get yourself a dose of shark cartilage to cure your cancer? Eh, it's probably not going to work. Um, what about uh, rhinoceros horn? Is that going to um, cure cancer or hangovers? Of course not. Um, nor is it likely to um, be an aphrodisiac. Um, do you know what a rhino horn is? It's basically the same chemicals as what makes up your fingernails. And, and when you catch, if you catch the rhino and cut off its horn, it will actually grow back. Um, but what the poachers do is they, um, simply kill the rhinos because it's easier to, to get the horns from them than to try and wrestle them for it. And what the conservationists in Africa often will do is cut the horns off of the rhinos to make them less attractive to poachers. And all of that industry is being driven by hype over, you know, it's going to increase your libido, it's going to make your erection stronger, it's going to do this or that for you, and it doesn't. We really should know better by now, right, uh, with CBD. Um, in the news, there have been stories about pesticides and heavy metals contaminating CBD oils. Um, there have been um, uh, articles about how these claims of benefit and fake products um, are driving regulatory scrutiny. Um, uh, in New York, they kind of clamp down on putting, you know, you, you, you go to Starbucks or you go to get your milkshake or whatever it is somewhere and, and they say, do you want a, a, an extra shot of this or an extra shot of that? And this one's for your energy and this one's for that. And would you like a little bit of CBD in your latte? You know what? Um, it's not likely, you're not going to put enough CBD into a latte uh, with a few drops of oil to make any difference to your body. If you're going to go to a dispensary and get one of these products, here's what the Mayo Clinic 
um, uh, uh, clinical guide recommended. And I think it makes sense. Um, look at who's making it. Does the manufacturer follow good manufacturing practices? Are they certified um, by the US Food and Drug Administration for good manufacturing practices? Um, or in, you know, by one of the similar organizations in, in other countries. Um, does the company have an independent adverse event reporting program? So that if you, some, you take their product and something bad happens, do they have a number that you can call to report it to so they can do quality control? Or is it impossible to even find the number? I had a patient who got, came, showed up in the office with a bottle a tiny little bottle like this. It was like this, not like this, it was like this. And um, the instructions were put three drops under your tongue for a week and then increased to nine drops. And, and I called the number on the bottle just to see, um, you know, where, 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 what is she getting? Who's this company? And uh, it was a phone number in New Jersey. And I got this Russian gentleman and I, I, I introduced myself and I said, you know, I'm just trying to understand how you could possibly put enough CBD in the bottle so that those three drops or nine drops make a difference. And he said, is proprietary, can't tell you. And, and um, I was trying to dig around where, where he was getting this stuff. And, uh, and it seemed like they were sourcing it somewhere in China. Um, and um, God knows what it really was. So is the product certified to be organic? Uh, has it been laboratory tested batch by batch to make sure that it's the real thing and it's not contaminated in some way? Um, those are important considerations. So to sum up, um, there is a pharmaceutical grade CBD 98% concentrated and pure, free of pesticides, free of heavy metals, that at appropriate dosing has been shown to be effective in treating seizures in Lennox, Gastro, Dervais, and tuberous sclerosis. It's FDA approved and sold as Epidiolex with a prescription. At the effective dosing, even at the minimum effective dose, there was a risk for um, uh, liver injury and drug interactions. The liver issues do require periodic laboratory testing to make sure that the patient is safe. So if you're doing this on your own, even if you've found a good, what you think is a good product, talk to your doctor about it, make sure that they're doing the testing to make sure the liver is okay. Um, the dispensary products, while they are legal in California and many other states now, are still federally illegal, at least until tomorrow. Um, and, they're, and, and as such, they're, um, they're, they're not allowed to make medical claims. The dispensary CBD products can have contaminants, um, can have variable dosing and, and strength and concentration from batch to batch. Um, may not contain the amount of CBD advertised. The recommended servings on those products are about one-tenth or less of the minimum dose that you would need to actually get an anti-seizure effect in most cases. Um, and there's little evidence for using cannabis in any form beyond um, the muscle spasticity, enhancing appetite and chemotherapy, uh, maybe pain, maybe some psychiatric stuff, but all of that in that last bullet is largely still being investigated and not commonly being used in the United States. So like with anything else, buyer beware. We can, I, I'm all done, Susan, we can open up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Wexler, really appreciate um, your thorough presentation. And yes, we have a couple of questions in the chat and we wanna be mindful of our next uh, speaker and topic. So I'll just jump right in. The first question comes from Cheryl. Is there any evidence for absorption of CBD oil such as Haley's Hope 
through mucous membranes such as gums? Not as yet. The, the mm -hmm. quantity that needs to get in is, um, is uh, for epilepsy, um, higher than you can get through the uh, mucosa. Now, um, the Sativex, which has been available in, in Europe for quite a long time, is an oral mist. And I'm not entirely clear on um, how much of that is absorbed through the mucosa versus also swallowed. Um, and that product, however, also has THC in it and is being used for muscle spasticity in, in other countries. So it's under investigation here, time will tell. But for epilepsy, um, you really need the real dose in the conventional way. Okay, thank you for that answer. And you already um, seem to have answered the next question, which was also related to, um, which was related to Charlotte's Web. My daughter takes Charlotte's Web CBD under her tongue. Is that the best way to administer? Yeah, we, we don't know, right? With right. Charlotte's Web and Haley's Hope and all these different products, we just don't know. Because honestly, people in the epilepsy community, doctors have approached these companies and have actually offered to do scientific studies to prove that their products work. And the, the epilepsy doctors have been shut down every time. Think about it. If you're selling a product, getting FDA approval, proving that it works as a medicine is the last thing in the world that you want. If you prove that it works as medicine, you fall under the FDA scrutiny. Then you have, then you have to follow the FDA production uh, rules. You, you, you have to be much more careful in what you're making. And you might get stuck selling your product by prescription. Whoever makes Charlotte's Web does not want Charlotte's Web to become a product that requires a prescription because that'll drive down their sales. So, we just don't know with these products because the science has not been done and the companies that make these products don't wanna do the science. Thank you. And the last question comes from Monica. My adult daughter has frontal lobe seizures and at times atonic. However, one of her AD management is on fee. Should CBD treatment pose a concern if interested in this type of medications? Currently with four ADs, we're in a space of uncontrolled seizures. Um, you know, there are, um, you wanna be careful when you add uh, Epidiolex or CBD to on fee because even lower doses of CBD like you might get from a dispensary can interfere with the metabolism of Onfi. And so you could see a lot of sedation. So it, it, what I do in my practice, it kind of depends on the, the dose that they're on. If I've got someone on a very high Onfi dose and I intend to add Epidiolex, I will typically back down on the Onfi as I introduce the Epidiolex to prevent excessive sedation. Um, if they're on a lower dose of on fee and they they and it's relatively new for them. I might just add the epidiolex first and see how it goes, and then back off on the on fee only if I see the sedation. Um, and and you know I don't. It's beyond the scope of this um, uh, lecture to be able to give you specifics on on your daughter because I don't know what other medications she's on. Definitely be careful if you're adding it on top of Depakote. And, and pay attention to the new therapies that are coming out. If she has frontal lobe seizures, uh, there is a medicine that came out um, a, a few months ago that at least on paper, when we do those unscientific comparing studies side by side thing, looks like it might actually be more effective than everything that's come out before it. And so in a lot of my patients who are in really in a tough spot, who've you know, cycled through most of the available medicines without much success, I, I definitely am trying that new medicine, um, uh, Excopri, that came out this summer. So for what it's worth, there are many, many things out there to try. Um, and some of them, I think, look, there have been breakout successes with everything. Uh, when Charlotte was um, uh, on, featured on Dr. Gupta's um, CNN special, um, she was doing great on Epidiolex, or, or on, I'm sorry, on uh, Charlotte's Web. And there are other people that have done really well on Charlotte's Web, but those are anecdotes, right? 
um, the fact that um, uh, the fact that someone won uh, a jackpot at the casino doesn't mean everyone going to that casino is going to win a jackpot. Um, so there are definitely super responders to anything, including low doses of approved medicines. When I saw that special with Charlotte on, on CNN, what I said was, gosh, you name the drug, I've got a patient who's done as well on the drug that you name as Charlotte's appears to have done with, uh, with uh, Charlotte's Web. But no one's doing a, a one hour CNN special on any of those other drugs because they're not as sexy as CBD. Well, Dr. Wexler, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us today with your talk and with all your information. Just know that all these presentations uh, are recorded and will be uploaded in a few weeks. So anybody that wants to come back and revisit some of the information that Dr. Wexler shared with us today, uh, you're more than welcome to. And the organizers will let you know through Facebook Live when those are uploaded. Dr. Wexler, it's great to see you virtually. Stay well, uh, be healthy, <laughs> and you as well. we'll talk soon. <laughs> yeah, and th thank you again for the opportunity to participate. What a fun forum. Thank you.